Hi, everybody. Thanks for starting your weekend with us at Bookish. We're the virtual program on authors, thinkers, and the literary life produced by the Southern California News Group. And I'm Sam Dunn. I'm the senior editor of Premium Content here. I need to tell you Bookish is sponsored by the Sagerstrom Center for the Arts in Conversation series. Coming up November 6th, they're featuring Amor Tolls, who's the best-selling author of The Lincoln Highway and many other great titles. Don't miss that. And of course, we always need to give a big thank you to our Reader Reward subscribers, and really to all of you for coming back every month supporting this program. But if you are a Reader Rewards member attending tonight, you're automatically entered to win a $50 gift certificate to our partner, Once Upon a Time Bookstore in Montrose. And I got to say congratulations to our last month winner, Debbie Stover. Debbie, hope you're enjoying those books. And, you know, clearly a lot of stuff, great stuff is going on here. So if you're not a subscriber yet, why not go to scng.com forward slash sub, sub, yeah, blah, forward slash subscribe to find your local paper. If you subscribe, you're going to know all about the great things we're, we've got going on. And also, if you've missed our past programs, go to scng.com forward slash virtual programs and check them out. Also, check out our cool bookish swag to show your book nerd pride there. Yeah, very important. I'll put the link in the chat for you pretty soon after after we get going. But before we do get going, let me remind you that if you have questions, and we hope you do, please use the Q&A feature on the Zoom toolbar and we'll try to get to those. If you just want to add a comment or talk to other people, use the chat feature found on your screen. And, you know, don't worry about missing anything because a link to the program is going to be sent to you so you can share it or just revisit some of your favorite moments. It's also posted again at scng.com forward slash virtual events. And again, you can find all of our past virtual shows and see what's coming up next. Now, joining us from Bohemian Splendor in Pasadena is our beloved host, Sandra Singlo. You've heard her on NPR's Morning Edition, on This American Life, and on Marketplace. She's also produced the syndicated Radio Minute, The Lowdown on Science. Sandra has been a contributing editor at The Atlantic and is the author of seven books, including Mad Woman and the Volvo. Sandra's new comedy, Mad Women of the West, starts off Broadway November 11th for an eight-week run, and that stars Carolyn Aaron, Brooke Adams, Marilou Henner, and Melanie Marin. Welcome, Sandra. Happy Halloween, our Halloween show. Happy Halloween. My house is so messy, I've actually blurred the background because it would be too scary, even <laughs> for people. So your son, Ben, who now is about eight or nine feet tall. Um, yeah, but- so is he now at that age where he's transitioning out of trick-or-treating? He's, he's, he's definitely- trying to sneak it in. Right. He's absolutely not in the trick-or-treating mode. He's in the high school party mode but still dressing as a sociopath like you know from halloween and all of those other movies that's what they do they they dress up and then they go scare each other at these parties i guess i don't know right or he could come out of, as a character out of let's say fight club or one of those kind of, like exciting and wild and violent For- novels which For- basically gets to we thought that our halloween show the how much fun would a scary thrill it would be to have America's, well, we'll, we'll talk to him when we talk, talk about what he is, uh, Chuck Palahniuk, a Palahniuk yes. of, of, the, of the Fight Club. He wrote the amazing book that became the movie, the David yes. Fletcher movie starring Edward Norton and Brad Pitt. And Meatloaf. That's so adorable that you say Meatloaf and the amazing Helena Bonham Carter. Um, and, and he's incredibly prolific and has a fantastic brilliant new book out but we got to balance the halloween feeling like, like we like to do in bookish we yes. would start with an author wonderful author who also has a book out amy ferris who uh, you know as opposed to the male energy has the female energy and as opposed to the violence however literary you can see uh i i've noticed that her icon is is a fluffy cat it, so. her fluffy cat listen amy is a is an icon of the female empowerment movement on facebook and and well you'll you'll see sh- soon enough i'm gonna i'm gonna just let you get to it right have you help help yourself make his his frightening yeah. halloween costume perhaps okay great Bye-bye. And first up, Amy Ferris, the 30-second download. Amy Ferris is an author, screenwriter, editor, and playwright. Her memoir, Marrying George Clooney, see how snugly that is. It's, you know, Confessions from a Midlife Crisis, 
debuted theatrically off-Broadway in 2012, Amy co-edited, along with Holly Dexter, the new anthology, the newest anthology, I should say, Dancing at the Shame Prom. She's contributed to numerous anthologies, including He Said What?, the Drinking Diaries, Exit Laughing, and The Buddha Next Door. She's on faculty at the San Miguel de Allende, if I said that, Allende Literary Festival, on the advisory board of the Women's Media Center, serves on the board of directors at Peters Valley Art Education and Craft Center, and is a founding member of the Scranton, Pennsylvania-based Pages and Places Literary Festival, Mighty Gorgeous, a little book about messy love from She Writes Press is out now. Welcome, Amy. Hey. Welcome, hey. welcome. It's so fun to see you. Thank you for coming on to Bookish. Well, thank you for having me. It is so good to see you. Yes. So first question up, I mean, Mighty Gorgeous, it's such a fun book to read. And it is very, it's like a book that you cradle to yourself. And I think one of the fans said, I think quite charmingly, and I think quite accurately, it's, uh, she called it a, a small book about big ideas. Um, and in this book, you open with the question, what would I tell my younger self at 12 or 13 or 15 at, as, as a teen, basically? And then you <laughs> ask that from the position of a woman who is 68. And I'm in my 60s, so I am very fascinated by the question. So I guess the question to you is, is what if, if you tell our readers and our viewers and our listeners um, why this question of what would I tell myself as a younger person of this age is there a special resonance that it comes from a 68 year old woman? Can you just frame that up a little bit to start off? Absolutely. It was Brooke Warner, who is my publisher. She is the publisher of She Writes, asked me that a really long time ago. And she said, what would you tell your younger self? And clearly that's a, that is a question that has been asked a lot, right? We hear that a lot. Well, I would tell my younger self to not sleep with that guy, or I would tell my younger self to not do that. And I thought about it and I thought, you know, I would tell my younger self to do exactly what she's going to do because it got her here. And well, would you, if you said that at 38 or 48 or 58, is that what you would say? Or does it take getting into one's sixties to be able to say that? I think it would probably take me into my 50s to say that because when I was 38, I wasn't married. I didn't meet, I hadn't met my husband, right? I had already had, you know, a slew of men in my life. But um, I think I would, at 38, I probably would say, do exactly what you're doing. Um, but I think at 68, I can say it with absolute conviction. Very interesting. Okay, so to go back for a moment of the arc of your career before we go back to the book, you know, you're a multi-genre writer, a screenwriter, you know, you a screenwriter, you movie writing, play writing, editing, and now to writing this. I wonder if you would give us a little bit about the trajectory of your career of um and and a ladder, a river, uh, you know, <laughs> like what. What's it been like as a journey? Because you've written in so many different genres. You know, I have to say that I dropped out of high school. And so I never went back to school. I literally dropped out at, at 10th grade. And I got my GED when I was 17 or 19, actually. Um, writing is something that I always did because it felt like my best friend. I always wrote. I didn't know if I would be a writer, but I knew that I loved writing. And I was very fortunate that I had some incredible mentors in my life, um, like Tom Fontana, you know, St. Elsewhere and Oz. And, you know, he read a two page short story that I wrote and hired me to, on a TV series, you know, um, I don't think that I've had that normal kind of track in terms of being a writer. I just knew that writing saved my life and I'm grateful that I get to do it. Yeah. And I think in, in Mighty Gorgeous, I mean, you talk a lot about, it's almost a direct address at certain points about 
you know, to young people, but to older people about finding, uh, expressing what you're feeling, you're telling your story, being loud about it. Um, I think that one of the anthologies that you, the great anthology, The Dancing at the Shame Prom, um, which is so, uh, there's something about shame that you're interested in that, that it's something that keeps us small. And then telling that story and articulating it is seems to be a way of finding community, expressing self. Can you talk a little bit about like overcoming shame? And, and sharing that and and <laughs> through writing and then finding a community. Um, I That's interesting when you say overcoming shame. I kind of think I tuck it away and it rear, <laughs> rears its head occasionally. Um, but that was an incredible anthology, anthology to co-edit with Holly Dexter. And it came out of, basically it was born out of both of us talking about how we had a lot of shame in our life and imagined that there were other women who had that too, you know? Um, and shame is very different for each person. You know, shame shame is, you know, kind of anybody, and, and any story can be filled with shame. So I, have I overcome shame? I think I've uh, looked it in the face. I think I've had a face to face with shame and said, you know what? You're not going to win. I'm going to win. So I don't think I overcame it. I think I faced it. Yeah. And I think that in your book and, um, and it's interesting. I mean, Samantha and I were talking because you're such a great member of the literary community and she's participated in one of your th anthologies yeah. um, of, of, and, and, you know, and we always think of social media as being a very much a young person's, they're on TikTok, but I think, you know, <laughs> Facebook for our generation has been really a great connector. And there's something about that community and then writing to that community um, that, that we've, we've all blended in and you actually do make that um, connection really successfully um, of, of telling our stories and, and going beyond. Um, and I think that what's fun to read about your book is it's very intimate. It's very like moment moments of address, and then there are moments of anecdotes, uh, et cetera. So it's really a fun read. I mean, I think since we're at the top of an hour talking about the many things of life, I mean, your book addresses, you know, there's another quote, there's life, love, money, work, and estrangement, pretty <laughs> much all the big ones. Um, and um, do you want to pick one of those and just give whoever's watching just a moment of the best piece of advice or the top three pieces of advice? Let, let's say top three on any of these three topics. And so they can get a flavor of how you look at things. And, and the categories are life, love, money, work, and estrangement. Top three. Uh, my top one is estrangement. <laughs> okay. And I've been estranged from my family now for 10, 12 years. And um, the best advice I ever got is what I will share right now, which is my therapist said to me, um, all of the guilt and all of the shame that you're carrying is not yours to own. And I thought that was pretty profound. And I could tell by your face that that is pretty profound. Because I think what happens with estrangement is we ask ourselves repeatedly, you know, what can I have done? What should I have done? What did I do? Why didn't I do that? Why are we no longer talking? And the truth is that it takes a couple of people to blow up a family. <laughs> it's not just not one. Just one? No, not just one. It does. It takes, um, it really does take a couple of people. You know, um, and estrangement is a very, you know, I found out recently or I'm finding out that it's a topic that many people want to talk about and have, are experiencing. I mean, it's, you know, without sounding too dramatic, it's very much like an epidemic. You know, when you say, oh, yeah, I'm estranged from my brother, me too. It's, you know, the same thing. People have are mothers and children, children and parents, fathers and sons, you know, and it's not only family. There's, it's something that we don't talk enough about. And yeah. I think there's, there's a lot of shame in that. 
when you say, I, you know, I haven't spoken to my family in 12 years. I think that's interesting. We were counterbalancing Chuck Palahniuk, but although his <laughs> book is very much about family and staying together and, and the idea that the love that we have doesn't solve everything necessarily. And sometimes right. you have to get rid of the thing that you love, et cetera. So I think that is actually very, uh, yeah, that, that's very haunting and that's very powerful. So not to own, okay, first piece of advice is the shame is not yours to own of this. Yeah. That you yeah. Have to it takes normal people. Okay, second piece of advice uh, mighty from Mighty Gorgeous, uh, life, love, money, work, or estrangement. I would go with love. <laughs> and, and what I would say, and I, I've had this conversation with Sam Dunn so many, many, many times. Um, love, <laughs> is, uh, love is hard work. It is really, really, really hard work. And I think a big piece of love is liking the person. I think- Oh, that's, that's too hard. That's not gonna happen in my life. No. <laughs> okay, there you have it, okay? No, but it, go ahead. You know, I, I like my husband. I really like him. He is a really good man. I also happen to love him very much. Um, so I think that when it comes to love, you know, love is hard. Love is really hard. It's hard work. You don't, you know, it's, you got to work at it. You got to work. At it. It's like losing weight or it's like anything you have to work at love. And I think that, which brings me now to work. <laughs> Number three. Very good. <laughs> which we could flip. And I think you need to love the work that you do. I, <laughs> so because the money won't follow. No, it it not only won't follow, it will get lost somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and right. It, and that's a whole 70s thing when I grew up, do what you love and the money will follow. That has not no, really that is not true. Yeah. You know, so many things that we were taught. <laughs> hey, listen, you went through menopause. I read your book. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, no, money does not follow. And I think Sam, if she were on with us, she would be raising her hand um, very much. Yes, right? Right, Sam? Um, it does not follow. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, I love what I do. I love writing. And I wonder, um, that that is, I actually that gives a pretty good trio of, of concepts. <laughs> You know, we do have a question from Claire de Perry, just for you, who's Claire de Perry is a bookish viewer. She's the vice president of a book club at her college. And besides your own books, would you recommend a book for a book club suggestion? Of course, you should get Mighty Gorgeous, so that will be first. But another book that you might recommend, maybe in the vein of what we've ta just been talking about. You know what I would recommend? I would recommend Melissa Guyberson's book, which is out right now called Late Bloomer, because it's a book about a woman who came out late in life. She had a husband, she had kids. And it's a book about finding your own love for yourself and this woman, the woman that she is ultimately with, Vivian. Um, I would recommend, recommend that for anybody because it's really about life. And it's about you know, we always talk about coming out and I think we, we come out, not just sexually, we come out in every way. You know, a closet is not just, you know, a closet needs to be open for everyone, whether it's emotionally, whether it's sexually, whether it's financially, whether it's, you know, in any way. And, and I, she's brave, Melissa. And I would recommend her book, absolutely. Melissa Guyberson, Late Bloomer. Fantastic. And I hope, Claire, that you note that down with your book club. And, and we do love hearing from our book clubs very much. Well, Amy, you are a delight in every way, but yes, in, in all the things that you do in your writing, Mighty Gorgeous is your wonderful new small book about big ideas, uh, messy love. Um, and, um, and, and you're such a great uh, member of the literary community. It, it's just it just every, everything about you is wonderful. So thank you so much for coming on. 
Well, thank you. And I, and I remember when I read your book, how much I fell in love with you and how, how much I love your writing. And I also can say the very same about Sam and Chuck. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be here. So thank you. Yes, and if this were Chuck Palahniuk um, Zoom, then we would say we love each other and that we might lovingly murder each other. Exactly. And it would also be an act of love. But there are some things about shame that actually are kind of resonant with Chuck's work. So we were trying to do a balance, but I think that's actually some similar themes coming up. So anyway, thank you so much. Um, you. Is, like I said, wonderful new book, Mighty Gorgeous, is on She Writes Press. And there is Sam Kissing. And here comes Chuck. Okay, thank you, Amy, and stop by back soon. All right, now transitioning immediately to Chuck, pronounced Polanuk, if I will. So the 30 second download, although really more than 30 seconds would be like, let's see if we can do it. Um, Chuck Polanuk's, I believe 19 novels to date, and, and they're being added to constantly, include the best-selling Snuff, Rant, Haunted, Lullaby, Fight Club, which we talked about already, always, Diary, Survivor, Invisible Monsters, and Choke, which was made into a film by director Clark Gregg. I just, it's so, it's so weirdly hilarious starring Sam Rockwell. It's, Choke is weirdly hilarious. I just have to say that on top of Michael. He's also the author of the nonfiction profile of Portland, Fugitives and Refugees, and the nonfiction collection Stranger Than Fiction, although in Chuck's world, uh, you know, yes, real life is strange as well. Short story collection Make Something Up was a widely banned bestseller. Oh my goodness, yes. And you know about Flight Club 2 hit number one on the New York Times list. That was actually a graphic novel. There was also Fight Club 3 and the coloring books Bait and Legacy, as well as the writing guide Consider This. But I'd also like to add this other description for those new who have just heard about Chuck's work, but not read just the 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 infamousness of it, if you will, um, that Chuck uh, explores in outrageous and comic fashion America's apparent love with violence. No one divides critics more sharply, while some view him as a literary nihilist, a man hell bent on killing the novel as a reputable art form. Others view him as a brilliant social satirist and the most important literary innovator of his generation. We lean to the second because we because he's so brilliant. Okay, brilliant new novel is not forever, but for now, welcome Chuck. Happy Halloween. Raise the roof. Hey, <laughs> I loved reading you. I loved reading you in the Atlantic. You're the first person who made that great observation about how your generation all had husbands who stayed home and just made the kitchen more beautiful. That was a landmark. That is so exploited. That that's so disturbing to think of you reading that and me saying that in so many ways. So so I wave a severed an autographed severed arm your way, which I believe yes. But you know, I love you for the same reason that I love Nora Ephron and that I loved Irma Bombeck. Is that you were all very very funny in that very relatable way, that very concise relatable way, and. You and I and Irma Bombeck have almost exactly the same birthday. You, you and I are only like 10 days apart. You're a Feb, you're an Aquarian? No, no, no. I'm a Pisces. I'm just over the border. Right, 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 right. Because I'm a, yeah. Oh, oh, my goodness. Well, that's so, and Irma Bombeck. Who was 21st, least, my uh, birthday. It, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Because she had that line speaking of menopause. of like, I'm trying very hard to figure out this generation. They figured out the timetable for bearing children such that, you know, um, going into menopause will happen the same year as they're learning to drive. So <laughs> that was, <laughs> never mind. But you, it's so thrilling to talk to you. And of course, I have looked at hours of interviews with you, mm. A, because you're so funny and so great. And I think it might surprise people if they, you know, just hear about, you know, they they just, you're, you're, you're such a rock and roll figure. It's, some many more people have heard of you than read you, but then they will read you. But then also hearing you talk is is great. And so I'll shut up now. Let you talk. First of all, <laughs> say happy Halloween. Does Halloween have any resonance for Chuck Polanuk? We always threw a gigantic Halloween party with like hundreds and hundreds of people. And right now we are putting spiders out through the woods and we are putting costumes together for this enormous haunted house. Uh, it is crazy. And a lot of that is because for my mother, Halloween was the artistic event of the year. 
And my mother just adored making costumes and the entire ritual of it. So it was bigger than uh, Christmas in our house. So that doesn't surprise me. Okay, so because there are some mothers, again, just having seen Choke recently and where Angelica Houston does this incredible job of playing the mother in that. And of course, in your in your new book that I, not forever, but for now, I think I forgot to even mention that with, <laughs> with the, these two twins and they have a certain mother. There are mothers that run through your books that are, let's say they're not the, not, are they Irma Bong Beckish? They're not the, the nice, whatever, June Cleaver mother. They have perhaps a dark side, perhaps an adventurous side, perhaps a breaking the law side, sort of intimacy. I'm thinking of like, is intimacy would be saying to a son, like, let's go run away or break the law, et cetera, et cetera. So does your mother, this is the stupidest question in the world. Is there any resonance to your actual mother with some of these mothers with, that we see in your book? You know, in a way, uh, when I write an over-the-top mother, I'm wishing that my mother had been that way because my mother was very, very uh, brilliant. She was fantastically gifted, but she was also not, she had no opportunity. So I really wish she'd been able to be a bigger, bigger, bigger person and live up to her potential. But she kind of put that into everybody else around her. That's so interesting. Okay, so... And that makes me think of a lot of things all, all at once of, of just like the duality, even in Fight Club of a character that's one way. And then there's another in, in almost you're almost wishing there was a second self or a dream way that they, they would be. But let's go to to your most recent book, Not Forever, But For Now. So you did a, actually a great interview with Peter Larson, the Orange County Register, all of Southern California news, news groups, newspapers about um, that you hate that most genteel of genres, yeah. the cozy mystery. Can you tell our viewers what you hate about the cozy mystery? You know, and I don't hate it so much as I sat down one winter when it was snowing and I read a whole stack of cozies and I was just appalled how someone could get their throat cut at a bake sale and nobody would react as if it was a violent event. That someone could get pitchforked in a rose garden during a rose contest and everyone would react as if it was a, a math problem. They all had to restore order and look for clues. And nobody expressed any emotion over the fact that this, this corpse was lying there bleeding out. So it was that disconnect between the horror and people's failure to react to the horror that seemed to make them uh, oddly funny and strange. And so I just wanted to ramp that up in a book and really do it to the nth degree. I mean, and I, when I think of those cozy mysteries, I certainly think of not just the Agatha Christie, although they, they're kind of bloody and people have some horror. But what I there's a connection between Britishness, Britishness that mm -hmm. is so funny about those. And I don't know if you see some of the awfulness about a certain kind of Britishness, because certainly in your book, the it takes place, yeah, sort of the dialects of the UK and the Queen, et cetera. I mean, can you talk a little bit about what Britishness means to you, or the UK-ness? Well, you know, and very much this this book is set in Britain, and it uses a lot of Brit speak. The whole book is Brit speak. And that was terrifically fun because it allows me a little bit of wiggle room. It's It's English, but it's not American English. And it's about these two little brothers. One is slightly older than the other. And the younger one is the narrator, and he just adores his older brother, despite the fact that his older brother is a psychopath. And it's very much the way that America adores Great Britain. Great Britain is our older brother. And regardless of what they do wrong, we are going to love them, and we're going to wish that we were them. And so it's kind of the younger brother kind of realizing that the older brother is a psychopath. Yeah, and I think the language, what makes it really funny even as one is horrified of course and that's partly intentional it's kind of like that they have some tutors some people who work in the garden who come to ends that are not not the most yes the the most savory ends if you will um so did you have fun writing the language of the way like Otto speaks and how do you when you write are you speaking it aloud I mean the dialect is so funny and it ranges all over the place are you are you speaking it aloud when you write how do you do that no I, I didn't speak it out loud but it was a, just a blast putting together the vocabulary because it really is a kind of 
Downton Abbey and upstairs downstairs situation, but you're also mixing in very high and low slang. Years ago, I was at a, a publishing dinner in London and I had been watching BBC America. So at one point during this very formal dinner, I excused myself and I said, I've got to go have a slash. And my publisher went crazy in a very quiet English way. Apparently, you don't just say, I'm going to have a slash. That is the most coarse thing you could say. But thanks to BBC America, Americans think that all of these incredibly coarse things are just common speak in the UK. And so it was a blast to mix the really low things and the really high things throughout the book. Um, yeah, so it is Downton Abbey with a lot of murders and a lot of euphemistic sex, because I found that if I could use just two euphemisms, have go and have it off, that people would fill in the blank and interviewers have come to me and said, how could you have written such filth? The book really has some smutty scenes, but no, no, no. I really only ever say have a go and have it off. And it is the reader who fills in that Rorschach test of what's actually taking place. So it's the reader's dirty mind that kind of finishes the book. Oh, you're an evil man. You're an evil man. That's so right. And you're, you are constantly wondering what's happened and all there is a nursery. And I think that people should, this, this book is so funny. It's hilarious to read. It is a bit like a murder mystery. All the levels of language are hilarious. And by the time you get to the end, you want to start again because you've realized something about the whole arc of the book. But there is a nursery where you think they're young boys and then you go, wait a minute. I don't think these are five-year-olds at all. There's the smell of the nursery and then fly. Yeah, so that you're inferring, gosh, I didn't think about it that way. But yes, you're making pictures in your mind that may be more horrible than what's, well, no, some of the things are pretty horrible. <laughs> you, you'll be Googling some uh, British slang for sex acts, it's true, um, along the way. I mean, I, I think what's interesting, and, and there is a sort of a central image of a Richard, Richard Attenborough nature show. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about, the, uh, about that image. So for, for viewers and readers, about what the nature show, why they're so obsessed with these nature shows. You know, uh, part of every book is trying to remember some developmental stage of my own, something that, a, a point at which I made a decision. And when I was a, a really small child, it was very traumatic to watch those Mutual of Omaha shows where the, the, the fawn would be hidden in the grass and we wouldn't know whether or not the hyenas were going to find this tiny baby and tear it to shreds. And as a child, you identified with the tiny baby fawn and you did not want to see it die. And you prayed that the mother could distract it and she could save its life. And all along would be Marlon Perkins whispering, the fawn is about to be discovered and torn to shreds in front of its mother. And it was so traumatic as a child that I wanted to revisit it in this book. But really those nature films are a kind of stand-in metaphor for online pornography. So it is very much about the predator-prey relationship. And, and just kind of putting it back at its most childhood, uh, basic, frightening level. Yeah, and I think what's interesting, and in when you describe Otto, who really loves his brother, and he has, and and I think there's something that you do that is that is so so fascinating and so part of your work is that there there can be let's say young young men or youngish men who are either violent or have bizarre proclivities that many would frown on, but there's such a tenderness so often at the core i'm thinking of of choke of you know a, a guy who's pretends to choke in restaurants and then people rescue him and they cradle him and so he finds he's almost held like the baby you know like like the baby you know, the baby kangaroo or the baby so so there's such a sort of craving for sort of love that's um mixed there and it's really fascinating to read, I mean, to read, um, and that's something that you you are consciously doing, of course, right? Of, of course. You know, so many books uh, put together a scam, but more often than not, it's always a scam about how to make money. We're going to rob a bank. We're going to do this big, uh, this big uh, thing. But my scams are all emotional scams. How are we going to scam people to love us so that we don't have to reciprocate their love? 
So in Fight Club, the big scam is to go to support groups for the terminally ill and to allow those people to, to think that you are also dying. So they will care for you and they will love you. And you can get this love without having to give love back. And so all of my books are about the emotional scams that people run in order to get love that they don't necessarily have to reciprocate. And they never really have to reveal who they actually are because they know that they are unlovable. And I think most of us think that we're unlovable. So on some level, we're running a scam like that. Yeah, no, no that's that's fascinating. And I think that, um, okay. So we have the treat of talking to you on Zoom. And, and again, in person would be even better. And either at one of your author events where you're given out severed arms, as I've heard, or doing a reading. And I, and I think folks who are new to your oeuvre, you know, it's it's your book tours themselves are rather legendary or legendary. I don't know, I'm, I'm speaking yeah. half British now. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it's interesting. I just want to say, you know, your short story, Guts, mm -hmm. that you will read that aloud and you ask the audience to do something while you're reading. Like, can, can you just fill in the audience a little bit on, on what happened when you read the story, Guts? I, I would read this story. And, and the first time I read it in my workshop to my friends, uh, people laughed and they thought it was just a very funny, dark story. But when I read it at a big public event, someone on the edge of this very large crowd fainted. And subsequently, at pretty much every event, we had at least one person faint. And finally, a doctor in Great Britain watched some people faint at Cambridge and said that the, the beginning of the story is very funny. And people laugh so hard, they become a little bit um, uh, hyperventilated. And so when the shock of the story lands, they are physically set up to pass out for a moment. And so we typically get anywhere from one to five uh, in Brighton, we got 18 people fainted in this enormous crowd, but <laughs> I quit counting a long time ago. So, okay. So, and that is basically, it, it has to do with some auto auto erotic work with the pool pump and something, something that does, goes wrong, let's say with that. And you ask people though, to hold their breath, right? When you were reading. Right. Uh, take uh, Hold your breath, take in as much air as you possibly can. This story should last about as long as you can hold your breath and then just a little bit longer. So listen as fast as you can. And I don't think that people actually hold their breath because they typically pass out at about 10 minutes into the story. They'd be dead by that point. Yes. No, and, and I think also with hyperventilating, I know in Fight Club, the Tyler Darden character talks about the masks coming down mm -hmm. in, in, in an emergency, and that's to get you high while you're going down. And I, I and I think that what, what's interesting and, and sort of the two halves of this book is should away the males and females, because it's not just men who are fans of your work, even though there are, and there are a lot of them, and, you know, you have... Your, your work really explore, you know, maleness in America, you know, sort of the, the, the males who feel like they're there, this is not their era, you know, they, they have nothing great to fight for, et cetera, et cetera, as in Fight Club, and that they maybe take the lower jobs and they're, 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 they're not achieving any, any kind of legendary greatness, but, um, and, but I think that women also are drawn to your stories and to that one, and I, I think there's something wonderful that you said which kind of weirdly dovetails into shame that you said at one point that you wanted to write, tell these stories that seem really outrageous. And often they think that you've done these things, that you're <laughs> that guy, um, but that you want to, um, you know, give other people what the strength or something to own their own stories. Can you, can you tease that out a little bit? Uh, you know, especially for young people, really their power depends on looking good and being vital and not losing face. And so if somebody can stand up there on the stage and completely publicly kind of debase themselves and choose to lose that power in a very deliberate way and then not do not die as a consequence, then it proves to young people that they have a lot more wiggle room, that, that, that they could lose face and they would not be destroyed by it. So it's about me looking like the idiot so that other people have the, the permission to look like the idiot. 
Right, or to tell these um, stories that, that themselves they may be ashamed of or a little off color. I, I wonder, and, and you are so funny about this, you know, and I think you're so open, which is why it was like, we well, have many fans and people frolic to your, you know, throng to your book reading in, in a way that, uh, you know, kind of standard authors, they're just very dull and they're just trying to be always, as, read their hit over and over again as possible. I wonder, you have told such a funny story about being hated by 800 people at Barnes at Lidl. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I think that is such a fantastic filleting of literary culture and important literary culture. And it just so explodes the myth of authors that just want to throw the scarf over their shoulder and get a Ford Foundation grant and have their asses polished as much as they go. Could you could you just talk about that incident? It was so fun. Oh, that that incident among so many. Uh, you have not lived until you've been booed by 800, 900 people. You have not lived until you've been hated by an auditorium of people and you've walked away from it and you don't die. I, I, that's, I would love to write a memoir called, And Then You Don't Die. Oh my gosh. Um, I, I, read, I read Guts at a Barnes and Noble in Austin, Texas. And they put me in the children's section because it was kind of the largest open section of this very large store. <laughs> and I set a record they said that they had never gotten 137 written complaints. That's 137 people who actually go and fill out the paper form. But that was a Barnes & Noble record. Oh, man, that was a night. And then the, another night in Skokie, Skokie Barnes & Noble outside of Chicago. I presented that night. And there was a very angry man in the crowd. And, of course, I called on him during Q&A. And this man with a Scottish accent in the middle of this huge mob of people says, so, Mr. Polinick, uh, do you masturbate to Brad Pitt's pictures? And what do you do with that? What do you do with that? You suck it up and you say, no, I masturbate to my bank account, bitch. So, no. So you just got, you learn how to deal with these really, these hecklers and you learn how to push back. And with every heckler, you get a little tougher and a little smarter. Yeah, and I think, well, could you, um, and then there's one one thing that I think when you were in New York, the time that I, I, I that you were in New York, that, that Barnes, one? the Barnes & Noble, you know, I don't know if that they'll be sponsoring oh. Bookish after this because it's it's chucks to infamy at Barnes & Nobles all across the country. So we'll just make a note, right, Sam? Oh. We lost Keep that. Keep in mind, it's a family show, guys. I just okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, no, sorry. no, this is a fan, no, yelled. Okay, so the, the New York one. You so the it. New York one, and I deserve the New York one. I teach that in my classes when one of my students in my workshop puts a cheap shot into a story. I had made the observation at the Barnes & Noble Union Square in front of six, 700 people. I said, Truman Capote made this, this great observation in Breakfast at Tiffany's that Americans do not love, they do not want classic natural beauty. Americans want a very plain person whose faults have been exaggerated and who has been so styled and so groomed that they can pass it as what Americans call beauty. And then I let a beat pass and I said, and that is why we have Sarah Jessica Parker. And 700 people in New York booed me and hissed me and wanted me off that stage because they adore Sarah Jessica She's Parker. She's the icon, the sex of the city, absolutely. And it was a cheap shot and I deserved that. But in line, everyone came up to you and said, I thought it was really funny. <laughs> Everyone came up and then leaned down and whispered, that was the funniest thing you said all night. So, so, so I, I think this idea of transgressiveness though, you know, and, and I think on this Halloween, it, it, it's like, that's the guy that does the transgressive things. Let's go see that. But I think that it, it sort of makes a land where everyone can, well, every, if they choose to be like, to laugh, to participate, to feel, somehow at home in a, a, a weird world where not everything is is perfect all the time. Um, and I think that in this book, um, was it fun writing your most recent book? Because it's a hilarious read. It was so much fun. I never wanted it to end. 
I was hoping it would sell enough I could write a sequel. You know, it was just a blast. I, yeah, just it was a sustained ecstasy, a sustained ecstasy. And I think with the Britishness, people should know that it, that part of the hilarity, it, just to add, like, is that there's a visit to the Queen of England, which, which is so laugh out loud in every way, but seems true. It's out, it's outlandish, but it seems weirdly true with the orgy, the corgis. It's like orgies of orgies. So <laughs> um, anyway, well, it, it's such a, you know, I, I consider you and bookish considers you an American treasure. We, mm -hmm. we lean towards the American treasure. Yes. You're a bit transgressive and fun, but your, your writing is, is so fantastic and we're really honored. And I see Samantha has popped on. Yes, well. we have a question from Kathleen Brady in the audience, which, which is a basic question, but always a good one. What is your writing routine, Chuck? Uh, my writing routine, wow. It's, uh, it's kind of different with every book. And a lot of times I'll just wake up in the middle of the night, uh, just completely, you know, freaked out and anxious. And I'll have to tell myself a comfort story, which I understand most people do as children. And so I'll just tell myself a comfort story and that will grow to become a scene. And eventually I'll have to get up and write it down in my notebook. So by four o'clock in the morning, I'm drinking coffee and I usually go back to sleep around five, but a chapter a night. It's obviously working. So oh my God, that's such a great answer and such a perfect Halloween Chuck Polanuck answer. That is really, that's one of the greatest writing routines we've heard thus far on the show. Okay, thank you so much. Oh my my God. Chuck Palahniuk's brilliant new novel is not forever, <laughs> but for now, and it is a fantastic read. It's just brilliant. When you get to the last page, you want to start over. It's really fantastic. Thank um, you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <thrill>. <laughs> thank you. What a pleasure. I've enjoyed your work for so long. This is so much nicer than I, I had no idea. You know, oh. yeah. It's a blast. Thank you. It, it's a love fest, Chuck. I love you. Now I must kill you. But oh, you know, and I, I love what you wrote about your grandfather too, being in those college classes. I loved all that stuff. Oh, that that's such a that's a thrill. And now I must kill you. Okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you so much. We look forward to the next book also. Okay. Happy Thank Halloween. You. Happy Halloween. Well, that was a humdinger. Oh, good. I'm sorry. I I said the B word. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Totally fine. No, come back. Come back. Okay. We love you. Okay. 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 So I'm signing off. So because Eric has his thing. Okay. All, All right. right. Well, thank right. you. And thank you, Sandra, as always. And thank you, Amy. And thank you, Chuck. Oh my gosh. And always thanks to our production manager, who is the reason for the season, really, Julie Corlett. You guys, don't forget to buy the books of, of Chuck and Amy uh, at Once Upon a Time Bookstore. Uh, we're going to be back next month with a new lineup of authors. So check for updates at, again, scng.com forward slash virtual events. And if you'd like to share your thoughts from today or you have additional questions, please email us at events at scng.com. And hey, if you want to give me suggestions for the show directly, reach me at sdunn at scng.com. Uh, and know that you don't have to wait very long at all for great content on authors sign up for book editor eric peterson's book pages weekly newsletter and speaking of eric here's a message from him on what's coming up in our newspapers thanks everybody we're going to see you next time bye Hey, thank you guys for having me on. Uh, I want to say coming in this weekend, we've got an interview with Obi Kaufman. You know his books. Uh, here's his latest, The Deserts of California. It is beautiful, and it's really interesting conversation that uh, that we've got with him. We've also got uh, an interview with Safia um, Sinclair, the author of How to Say Babylon. That'll be in print. You can also read it online right now, uh, as well as Obi. Uh, and also, if you like to be scared, because this is the scaring time, uh, we have 20 books. Of, this is one of them. We have 20 books uh, that are 2023 brand new scary books that uh, Michael Schaub, uh, our contributor, uh, put together. It is a great list of, uh, of fresh stuff. So if you've read all your 
Poe or whoever, and you want something uh, new uh, with some fresh perspectives, it's great. Uh, so please do that. And then also I'll wrap up by saying that uh, hopefully I'm recording this on Thursday. Uh, I will have for you in the newsletter tomorrow an interview with uh, Oliver Jeffers that I did the other day. He is fantastic. His books are fantastic. Uh, I hope uh, even if you don't read what I wrote or our interview, I hope that you just one day pick up one of his books because they're just a delight. So that's enough from me. Uh, thanks for uh, letting me be here. Take care, everybody. Enjoy your reading.